So with that, what I'd like to do first is bring up to the stage Nick Bond, who's going to give us a, a rundown on climate. Thanks. Thank you. So I'm actually going to go back a year earlier. There, were, there was a big and uh, amazingly persistent ridge of higher than normal sea level pressure off the coast of the Pacific Northwest in the autumn of 2013 into the early winter of 2014. That um, blocked the usual parade of storms into the Pacific Northwest, ended up the oceans quite a bit warmer than normal. Um, and uh, yeah, okay. Um, and uh, so uh, that has kind of set the stage for this climate event that we're in right now. And so what I want to do briefly here is go over a little bit about how that um, ocean became so much warmer than normal, but mostly focus on the implications of a warmer than normal ocean for both the marine ecosystem and uh, the, the weather of the Pacific Northwest, especially in the vicinity of the Pacific Coast. All right, one of the things I want to uh, emphasize, though, is that what was happening to the ocean was... Uh, not a static sort of thing, but a, a dynamic. It evolved over time. These are uh, uh, snapshots, three-month periods, um, starting on the upper left uh, from um, late summer of 2013, three-month periods in, through the end of 2014. These are the sea surface temperature anomalies in normalized form in, um, whoops, there, in terms of um, uh, how many standard deviations above normal. I focused on that uh, middle panel on the left there, early 2014, in which there were temperatures four standard deviations greater than normal uh, hadn't been seen before that time of year. And, uh, but again, notice how the, uh, where the warmest water has changed over time. Okay. So uh, just very briefly, um, I want to go over a little bit about, uh, again, how the ocean came into that state. From an atmospheric point of view, I'd like to emphasize on this slide the red trace there that indicates uh, for a time series from 1980 through uh, the winter of 2013-14, what the um, wind mean, mean wind speed cubed was. This parameter uh, relates is proportional to the rate of turbulent mixing uh, so, um, energy supplied by the atmosphere of the ocean to mix cooler water from below. It was a record low. Uh, the blue trace is the wind stress curl, how much uh, kind of a vorticity or twist the um, atmosphere is putting into the ocean. It was unusual, not a record. Um, the one thing that I've really focused on, on the, in this case is kind of what was happening in the upper ocean. And I don't want to belabor that here. I want to get more into what caused the ridge in the first place and some of the implications. So I just would like to direct your attention to the bottom trace there, the purple line showing again back to 1980, that um, the ocean cooled off a lot less that year than usual for that time of year. It usually cools off seven and a half degrees C or so. It was like five and a half degrees C, which is just not something we had seen before. Okay, but the, um, the, the real question is what caused that dumb ridge of higher pressure that meant a warmer ocean? And there I'm leaning on some uh, results that uh, a host of other colleagues have done. And uh, some of the uh, more, I think, interesting and compelling work is um, led by um, Richard Seeger, among some other folks. And their um, interest was looking into what was uh, causing the extreme drought in California, and um, in particular, the atmospheric um, patterns. They uh, put out a report. It's um, now uh, been published as a paper in the Journal of Climate. And uh, this is one of the slides from their work. And I want to spend a little bit of time here. Again, uh, this kind of summarizes what was happening two winters ago. The colors there over the ocean, the reds mean sea surface temperatures above normal. Blues are cooler than normal. Over land, the colors refer to the precipitation anomalies with the browns being dry, greens being a little wet. Uh, the lines have to do with kind of geopotential height in the upper troposphere, essentially pressure patterns. 
and these pressure patterns are more or less vertically stacked, so it, it reflects to a large extent what goes on at the surface too. And there, direct your attention to the Northeast Pacific where there was higher than normal pressure, uh, kind of near that, those really red colors, really warm ocean temperatures, and then a low over Hudson Bay, the circulation around that low delivering cold air into the Great Lakes region, and again, uh, the high further west blocking our storms. And so there was a lot of interest initially about, wow, the, that sea surface temperature is off our coast. That seems like maybe it caused these weird weather patterns. But some of the work that Seeger and et al. and some other um, uh, independent studies have shown is that it's, that's probably not the case, that the sea surface temperatures off our coast were more a response rather than a cause of the weird weather patterns. And there, uh, I'm going to have to go through this very quickly, but uh, through some atmospheric model experiments in which they prescribed sea surface temperature patterns based on the historical record and then ran a bunch of atmospheric models over that, they found that um, the uh, kind of the driver of this climate variability seemed to be the far western tropical Pacific. And so if you could direct your attention to the leftmost column of figures there, there's a, um, from these atmospheric model runs, there's a series of kind of highs and lows emanating out of the tropics to mid-latitudes that, um, and so the key there was what was going on in the far western tropical Pacific near New Guinea. And uh, a schematic that has been trotted out uh, for years uh, having to do with how uh, El Nino uh, impacts higher latitude weather applies here also, but everything kind of shifted to the west, where, where this warm water was in the tropical Pacific, there are large, long-lasting clusters of thunderstorms, and that has this kind of ripple effect to, to higher latitudes. Okay. Um, some other work, kind of approaching from a different point of view, looking at atmospheric patterns that are seen in the historical record and how they relate to SST basically came to the same conclusions. So again, we can kind of blame the far western tropical Pacific at least for the start of what has happened in this uh, kind of short-term climate event. Okay, uh, I want to get back to the idea that um, it's not a static situation. Here again is uh, this is the sea level pressure anomalies in the early winter 2013-14. Last winter, it was a much different sort of pattern with uh, lower than normal pressure off the coast. The circulation around this sort of um, uh, sea level pressure anomaly pattern meant uh, winds, uh, anomalous winds from the south and east, which helped produce um, warm, uh, air temperatures of the Pacific Northwest and actually caused um, more of a coastal um, uh, warming of the ocean. And so here again, this is this plot every three months. You can see in that um, middle figure on the left where the, the blob was offshore. Here at the end of 2014, it was more a wide strip of warmer than normal water along the coast. Um, the ridge reared its ugly head again uh, this past spring into summer and uh, helped cause us to, you know, the one-two punch with the warm winter and then the drought following. Uh, that helped, um, but the, the circulation, the clockwise circulation around this higher than normal pressure meant that um, north winds right along the coast and a little bit on the moderation of the temperatures right along our coast in the past few seasons. And so that's illustrated again with these kind of normalized temperature anomalies where you can see that early in the year, warmer water kind of um, right near the coast and uh, greater anomalies. And they've uh, moderated some and then the very last figure there and then July, September, you can see it's actually near normal right along our coast um, a few months ago. Okay, so that's uh, your whirlwind tour of what happened in the climate system and in the ocean from a physical side. I want to uh, focus a little bit on all the, uh, some of the ecosystem uh, impacts. A lot of these slides are taken from colleagues that I'm working with, fishery oceanographers, ecologists, and so forth. This is from um, a colleague at one of the NOAA fishery science centers. 
and um, all sorts of implications for the ecosystem. Some of them are these kind of anecdotal sightings. We've all seen these in the newspaper. Fish um, well north of their usual ranges. Um, um, and have plenty of examples. The all-time record OPA catch in uh, Washington was the, a couple of months ago. Um, that's fine, and that's uh, useful information. But what I think is more important is what was happening at the base of the food web. In particular, at the, the kind of the plankton and zooplankton level, it turns out that uh, our waters off the coast here are kind of a battleground between uh, species that are more adapted to warm water and those that are more cold water species. Turns out that the colder water ones, the boreal species, are larger, fattier, and more nutritious. And um, uh, a number of people have shown that the salmon, especially, um, they go to sea, uh, when they encounter these cold water copepods, their chances of uh, higher survival rates are a lot better than when they encounter these subtropical species. Um, here's a time series, um, I didn't give credit to Bill Peterson of the Manoa Fisheries Lab, that um, shows that back to the late 90s, the reds indicate uh, when there are more southern species, there's a lot of, uh, more diversity too, it's kind of a species richness, but just the red colors are the warm water species, the blue are the cold water species, and notice in the last year that the um, uh, a preponderance of these warm water species, it was even greater uh, change than when it was seen in the massive 97-98 El Nino. And so this is um, uh, really got the attention of a lot of um, the fishery oceanographers. Some of the ramifications are all the way up the food web, uh, massive die-offs of some species of seabirds, and uh, one thing that is uh, particularly alarming is some of the things we've seen uh, in terms of harmful algal blooms. This is um, uh, Vera Trainer of um, NOAA and some uh, Department of Health in the uh, Washington State and so forth. Have um, there's been some big ramifications, closures of uh, uh, recreational clam harvests, um, commercial Dungeness crab harvests. Um, seen um, sea lions and other marine mammals eating infected fish and uh, uh, these are neurotoxins and uh, kind of dying from that. Uh, the, this, these traces here really bring home how unusual this particular event was. In a typical year, um, uh, the 2005 there, uh, the blue uh, trace shows when um, uh, levels of this um, neurotoxin domoic acid in clams gets to the regulatory level. And usually, they, uh, when it happens, they blip up and go back down. The red trace there is the, um, the plankton pseudonychia that actually creates that toxin. Compare that to the lower panel there, where there was a massive bloom of this uh, pseudonychia. And uh, the uh, toxins in the clams lasted all summer. And uh, these um, harmful algal blooms uh, were noted from Monterey all the way up to Alaska. And so we've never seen anything like this. And this is a real wake up call. Okay, just in the last couple of minutes, I want to talk a little bit about what the temperatures off our coast do to our weather. Right? And so what I've done is some very simple-minded stuff. I can't do anything else for that matter, but I just looking at an SST index for that box that's indicated here and looked at how it corresponds with the weather inland. Our prevailing winds uh, in the Pacific Northwest are generally from the west, and so um, you would think it might have an effect. And indeed, it does seem to have that effect. Um, looked at various seasons. Here's an example where I looked at the October SSTs in that box. It's on the x-axis there. And then for the rest of winter, November through March, what the temperatures were like in Washington State. Now, there's obviously a positive correspondence. It's not one-to-one, -one, but there is an impact, again. And other things, unusual weather patterns can overwhelm that. Um, what we've seen at various locations along the west coast, uh, these traces are from uh, early or uh, spring 2014 through spring this year, they've continued through the summer, is that day in, day out, it was warmer than normal at places like Astoria, 
San Francisco, San Diego. And this is, um, especially along the coast, with those winds off the west, you got warmer water, it makes warmer temperatures. Um, here, I uh, just some recent stuff uh, fooling around with. I took this SST index and I correlated it with air temperatures um, on the left and uh, low level humidities on the right uh, uh, patterns. And this is going back to uh, from 1948 to the present. And here the idea was how far does this influence of the ocean extend inland? And uh, here also from uh, uh, the point of view, is there any predictive power here? I, I'm having the SST index kind of lead by a couple of months what these, uh, the air temperature and humidity index. And what you can see is um, uh, definitely there's a, the influence is stronger up to the Cascades and less so on the other side, which makes sense. I'm not quite sure why there's a uh, stronger signal with the humidity that apparently is a more conserved property. Um, and um, one thing I want to get back to here is the idea that while the sea surface temperature, because the air is flowing over it, has, does make a difference to our weather in terms of the temperatures, humidities, and so forth, it doesn't appear to impact sea level pressure and wind patterns. And here I've done, as, again, some ideas where looking at the atmosphere leading the ocean versus the ocean leading the atmosphere. And, uh, it just turns out that the sea level pressure, the winds, are a better predictor of the SST, but not the reverse. And um, with that, I'm going to just go to my final remarks here. And I, I'm available in the next couple of days if you want to uh, kind of more about what I've gone through really fast. Um, We've had uh, some remarkable weather, and that has resulted in some unprecedented things that have happened in the ocean. And we can blame, at least in part, the start of this weird weather to what was going on in the far western tropical Pacific. And uh, uh, that those warm ocean temperatures helped make us warmer here for the last year and a half or so. And they're definitely having uh, major impacts on the ecosystem that are still playing out. So with that, thank you. So we have time for a couple questions. If you want to ask a question, come up to the microphones located in the aisles. Hey, oh, got a customer. Cool. Yeah, it w um, yeah. The uh, the question was, what were the toxic levels in salmon for human consumption? All the co commercial catches are very carefully monitored in that case. But you're exactly right. There is that potential. If they're eating forage fish that are contaminated, just like the marine mammals are eating forage fish that are contaminated, that's a, a real concern. And it just turns out that as far as I know, they weren't finding um, especially high levels in those. Um, and it's in part probably because uh, much of the feeding of the adult salmon is um, maybe further offshore and some of these toxin levels were closer to the coast. So. Could it be that uh, salmon accumulate the same way as some of the shellfish? Yeah, the question was whether um, salmon don't accumulate the toxins in the same way as the shellfish do. That's quite possible. Um, Certainly the clams that are sitting there on the shore, they're just filtering whatever is, is happening. And so these pseudonychia blooms do tend to be in the kind of the shelf region. But I'm, um, I'm getting outside my area of expertise, way outside, so maybe one more. Ah, good question, and something that I meant to mention is that because of the uh, linkages to our weather to what's happening in the tropical Pacific, it's not just, a, a lot of folks have been wondering, how's the ENSO cycle going to change with climate change? Well, what they have to look at here, it's not just ENSO, but everything that's going on in the tropical Pacific that uh, um, conceivably has an impact on our weather. And so if there are systematic changes in the far western tropical Pacific, we'll fill them. So thank you. <laughs>